Okay. Do we think uh, we've got everybody, Cindy? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, let's go ahead then and call the Johnson City Council meeting number 20 24 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Cope? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Roca? Here. Let me uh, proceed to read the COVID-19 information statement due to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with Governor Reynolds' March 19, 2020 proclamation, suspending the regulatory provisions of Iowa Code Section 21.8 or any other statute imposing a requirement to hold a public meeting or hearing, the City of Johnson will conduct meetings electronically with the public allowed to attend per instructions allowed per instructions denoted on the meeting's particular agenda. Meeting minutes will continue to be posted per the city's normal course of business. Having read that, I would uh, wanna welcome everyone that is with us this evening. Uh, if you are here for an item that is on the agenda, we would ask for you to wait for that item to come up. If you're not here for an item that is on the agenda, there will be an opportunity under public communications to address the council. Cindy, can you tell uh, if we have uh, members of the public that are with us that want to speak on any particular items? I, I heard you say that we do have uh, our special guests with us this evening, but can you tell whether or not there are others with us as well? I can't tell specifically, but I would ask that anyone who is in the audience for something not on the agenda to go ahead and raise their hand. It appears they're all here for something, so. Okay, well, if you are attending this evening and if you are here for something other than uh, our recognition of the Johns girls, Johnson High School girls cross country team, please let Cindy know um, what, your, uh, what your agenda item is and whether or not you would like to speak. Moving on to the next item, the agenda approval. Uh, Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? There are no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay, council members, any changes? If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So move, move. Martin. Second Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Council member Evans. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka. Yes. Cope. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to public communications. The first uh, item that we have under public communications is to recognize the 2020 Johnston High School Girls Cross Country Team for their state championship. Um, I can't see any of them. However, uh, I, I know they're there. And I would just ask, is, is the head coach, Pat, Pat, Pat Hennis with us? Yes, he is. Okay. Pat. Pat, can you turn your audio on? Yes, can you hear me now? Fantastic, you bet, you bet. Why don't you share with us who you have with us this evening? Well, um, I think that uh, we have six out of our seven members of the um, state championship team with us. And that would be um, uh, Bella Hykus, who is a senior, uh, Aaliyah Tempest, who is a junior, Olivia Verde, who is a freshman, uh, Ashley Faber, a senior, Sam Strauss, another senior, and Bailey Vaughn, who is a ju junior. And then um, the, the one member of the team who's not with us is um, Faith Need, who is a junior, and she has a show choir rehearsal tonight. So these um, are some ladies that are, are fast, and they're also very involved in, in lots of things at the school and in the community. Absolutely. I thought maybe coach, you were going to tell me she was still out running and she forgot to stop by. <laughs> <laughs> that could be too. Yes. So do you have some of your uh, assistants with you this evening? Yeah. So um, we have um, my, uh, myself in terms of the high school staff, it's myself and, and Chris Seward. Um, and we have been coaching together now. I think we figured out that it's been 18 years that we've been coaching wow. together. Yeah, and then um, we also have um, uh, Carly Fitzgerald uh, with 
and um, and then Michelle Poss and, and Coach Poss, uh, her son was was getting some minor surgery done today, and so she wasn't able to make it with us. Uh, but um, and then we have our two junior high coaches who uh, they're with us all summer, and you know they are uh, extremely important part of our program, and that's Jody Buchan and Kayla Lund. Great. Well, we want to welcome all of you uh, for, be, for being with us this evening. You know, it's it's always fun to do this in person um, because you can just kind of feel the the excitement and enthusiasm in the room from the girls as well as uh, from everyone who works with the girls and support the girls uh, in their in their efforts and accomplishments. But you know, I I, I you know that I couldn't be more proud of what you have done, Coach. What uh, what your uh, your team has done uh, to get these girls to the place that they are, that, you know, they have won now, uh, you know, first place two years in a row. And uh, they've, 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 you know, been winners five out of the last seven years. I mean, that is just absolutely incredible. You guys are just doing an amazing job. Well, we appreciate that. And, um, and I know that uh, these ladies appreciate uh, all of the support uh, our, our team and our coaches, uh, all the support that we get. Um, I was just reflecting on um, my run this afternoon. I, I went out and, um, and just the great trails that we have and, you know, the foresight that um, the city has had in, in terms of providing those, those opportunities and, and making it such a great community for us to run in. Well, we're doing it for you, coach. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Keep, keep them coming. We love those trails. Yeah. And, and coach, you know, this, uh, probably some of your girls know this. I don't know that the council members know this, but, but, uh, not only do, uh, do the girls, you know, um, you know, go out and run and, and make us all proud, uh, in their, you know, in, in what they do, uh, in their cross country running. Um, but also uh, several times I've seen, the kind of community support that we get from you is uh, is incredible as well. Um, frequently, I've seen you at the Des Moines Marathon uh, at mile 20, which is which is a tough mile uh, of a marathon. You're there and and uh, you're lending support to all of the uh, uh, marathoners in in that race as well. And and I can't tell you how how proud and pleased I am to see you at that uh, place in the in the marathon. Absolutely, and. Um... And we, we are, uh, one of our goals is to um, provide more opportunities um, for, for running and racing once, um, you know, once we get through our, our pandemic here. And um, we have a new cross country course that's gonna be opening up at the high school. And our goal is next summer to put on the Dragon Dash 5K. Uh, and so um, we will be coming back and um, probably talking with John and, and hopefully partnering up the city with the city on that a little bit. Absolutely, that that would be great. And I know that all my colleagues on the city council will be out there with me running it. Mm -hmm. Right, guys? <laughs> I'll be looking for council member Soroka, that's for sure. There you go. Well, we, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for everything that you do in the community. And uh, again, keep it, keep up the good work, uh, both uh, coaches, assistants, as well as uh, you long, young ladies that are with us this evening. You know, uh, running is a sport that you can do. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a lifelong sport. You can do it for the rest of your life. You can do it with or without other people. And, and it's just a great way to, to stay both physically and mentally fit. So keep up, keep up the good work. You're making awesome. us proud. Thank you, Mayor. And, and we'll look for you out on the trails, okay? Ab absolutely. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks, all. You bet. Bye-bye. Yep. Now I've lost my agenda. I think the next, here we go. The next item we have is an update on DART. Cindy, I'm guessing we probably have Elizabeth and Russ Trimble with us this evening. Yes, we do. There they are. Welcome, Elizabeth and Russ. 
The floor is yours. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, share an update on DART with you this evening. Um, and uh, also, Mayor Dierenfeld, we just greatly appreciate your leadership on the DART Commission um, over the years. You you are a great, um, great advocate and just appreciate all the leadership that you bring to the DART Commission. Uh, with that, I'm going to um, open it up, uh, let Russ uh, provide a few comments before I present. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, and, and thank you, Mayor Dierenfeld, and thank you, uh, Council. Um, I would just simply echo um, what Elizabeth said, you know, having your mayor uh, on the DART Commission, uh, she is just a great uh, member. She's on the uh, executive committee as well uh, with me and just does a phenomenal job representing you guys. So thank you, Mayor, for your service. Really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the chair of DART, uh, and I just want to start out by saying uh, Thank you uh, to Elizabeth and the DART team. I want to compliment them. DART, um, when compared to other like transit agencies across the country, is one of the most efficient, effective transit agencies uh, in the country relative to our peers. And uh, Elizabeth and her staff are always working to become more efficient, more effective in everything that we do. Um, over the last year or so, in the name of efficiency and effectiveness, um, uh, we've been working hard to implement different initiatives and to better align cost and benefit for our member communities as well. And uh, the commission and staff have done a lot of heavy lifting. Some of the initiatives I just want to mention very quickly. Um, first, the transit optimization study. Um, we commissioned a study and hired a consultant to study innovative and creative ways to provide transportation services. And this has involved looking at things like Uber and Lyft and zip cars and e-bikes and scooters and a whole host of other modes of transportation to get people from point A to point B. Um, and that study is, is still underway. But even before uh, we got into the, the meat of that study, we quickly implemented uh, a Flex Connect, Flex Connect pilot project, which is a pilot project in the city of Irvindale in a zone that uh, we weren't having a lot of, of trips in. And what we do there is we've allowed residents in that area to, uh, we've contracted with Uber and Yellow Cab and residents are taken from their home to the this bus stop. And then from there, they can take the bus service wherever they need to go. Um, a lot, doing that allowed us to cut out uh, one bus and one driver and actually repurpose that and use it in another uh, area in the trail. Um, in, in addition to um, the Flex Connect and transit optimization study, we've been right-sizing our buses. We've realized that uh, we don't need big, gigantic 40-foot buses um, on all of our routes. And so we've done what we could to try to save a little bit here and a little bit there. And we actually just recently purchased five 30-foot buses instead of 40-foot uh, buses. And doing this, we've saved just a little bit on the gas, and we've saved a little bit on the purchase of the bus as well. But having a fleet of over 100 buses, the more we do this, the more we're going to save little by little, and it will all add up. Um, another uh, thing that we've put in place is we have a position review team now at DART. So Elizabeth and her staff will take a look at um, people that leave through attrition, and they'll get together and discuss uh, whether or not we need to hire back and refill that position. And if not, we'll just leave the position open. So we've got an ability to save some money and be more efficient and effective there as well. And then last but not least, uh, we've spent a lot of time, and the mayor can tell you this, had a number of meetings on uh, better aligning cost and benefit for our member communities uh, based on population and service. And so we've looked at our funding formula and uh, have suggested a change in that funding formula that, again, will better align that cost and benefit based on the population of the community and the service that they receive. And Elizabeth's going to go into greater detail on that, so I won't say anything more about that. But uh, we're just working hard to be as efficient and effective as we can, and we'll just keep doing that in the future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Great. Elizabeth? Yep. Cindy, are you able to pull that up? Can you see it now, Elizabeth? Yep. Okay. All right, you can move to the next next page. 
So um, thank you again uh, for allowing us the opportunity to present. So tonight I'm just gonna give you a reminder of the DART services that you have in Johnston, um, provide you uh, an update on our transit optimization study, as well as the property tax formula. And then just also an update on the conversations around DART operations and maintenance facility and plans for the future. And then also um, some of the things that we're planning for as we look to the future. Next slide. So we have three um, primary services that we offer at DART. The first being our fixed route service, which is your traditional fixed route um, local bus service with a schedule and bus stops. Um, our ride share service, which is our van pool program. And that extends for about a hundred mile radius around the Metro. And that is geared at um, bringing people from um, rural communities to jobs here in the Metro, as well as taking people who live in the, in the Metro out to rural employment sites. And then we also have our paratransit service, which is geared for people who either have a cognitive or a physical disability and can't access any of our other services and need special assistance um, for mobility. From a service priority standpoint, as we think about new service, we're really geared towards getting people to work, to medical appointments and education. And in Johnston, you have um, local Route 5 serving the Merle Hay Corridor, your Express Route 93 serving the 86th Street Corridor, as well as paratransit service um, throughout Johnston. Next slide. Um, here's a map showing kind of the Route 5. It does um, serve many, several neighborhoods in Northwest Des Moines and then extends to, to Merle Hay Road um, uh, and serving Johnston up past north of City Hall by the library and some of your, your residential development um, um, north of Northwest 62nd Street. Um, that service was extended a couple of years ago and we've had a really positive response of having that um, neighborhood service on, um, in that northern part of Johnston. Next one. And then also our 93 Express service, which is um, focused on the 86th Street corridor. It also was extended last October to, to um, serve um, the area northwest, uh, north of Northwest 62nd Street and on Northwest, uh, northwest 100th Street. And we have seen pre-COVID, um, did see quite a bit of ridership growth in the couple of months um, since that had been implemented and look forward to once we get back to, to normal times, um, growth in that ridership continuing um, in that part of Johnston. Next slide. So our transit optimization study is a study that really is geared towards um, identifying ways to optimize our existing service um, finding ways uh, in identifying um, what our evolving transportation needs of the region are as we look to the future and we continue towards having a million people here in the metro, as well as evaluating innovative um, service delivery models um, such as microtransit and other first mile, last mile um, type services and ride hailing such as Uber and Lyft. And then at the end of the day, we hope to develop a long-term vision for DART services. Next. And so what this might look like is um, substituting some of our, may, potentially substituting um, some low productivity routes or routes that we have, have little ridership with other sorts of service models. So whether it's partnering with an Uber or Lyft in that area, or DART providing um, a smaller scale shuttle service that really um, utilizes technology. Those are different approaches that we could, we could be looking at. Also thinking about how do we best serve um, the growing areas of the region and kind of where the, um, as the region gets bigger in, in size. Um, not all of those areas will be appropriate for a 40 foot bus. And so we want to be nimble and thoughtful in the matching those areas and the, the development and the density with the right type of service. And then we'll also be thinking about how do all of these sorts of transportation modes work together? 
and thinking about are there areas within the community that several of them are aggregated, such as if we have bike share or a scooter share in the future, how do those interact with a Flex Connect or a partnership with Uber type stops and then along with our regular transit um, services. And so thinking about are there opportunities to create hubs and then also making sure that we're not forgetting about our main corridors and providing the, the best service possible um, in our key corridors throughout the region. Next service or next slide. Um, so we have uh, started this study last fall, um, early winter. Um, it did get delayed um, with COVID. And so we um, uh, have continued um, to pick that up here this fall and um, completing our market analysis and looking at different um, mobility alternatives. We hope this spring to be able to bring back out uh, or solicit feedback from the general public on current and future mobility needs, and then um, take that feedback and develop recommendations over the course of the summer, and then um, get feedback and take that back out to the public in the, in the summer, early fall, with the hopes of uh, being able to bring an integrated mobility plan to the commission for approval um, in the fall of next year. Next slide. Some of the other things that we're working on, um, Russ also touched on, is um, looking at our 30 foot, 30 foot vehicles and where um, we might be able to um, put the, utilize those for service on more routes throughout the metro. We currently um, introduced five this summer, um, and our hopes are to purchase another um, 20 of those vehicles over the next five years. We also introduced um, two weeks ago and put into service our electric buses. We purchased seven of those in partnership with Mid-American Energy um, earlier this year. They are performing very well in service, um, even given the, the cold weather we've seen thus far this winter. And so look forward to continuing to monitor and evaluate those vehicles um, here over the course of the next couple of years to determine if um, it would be wise for DART, DART to continue to purchase electric vehicles in its fleet. We also introduced last October our Flex Connect pilot program which is a partnership with Yellow Cab and Uber um, in a zone in Urbandale. Um, we look to want to look to expand to a second zone in the Urbandale Business Park um, in the early um, summer of 2021. Um, and so that will be exciting. And then the commission in November also um, approved a reduced fare pilot program that will run from January of 2021 through the end of June. And that really looks to uh, reduce the transportation barriers for those that are experiencing financial hardship. And so what it will do is allow um, residents in the Metro to be able to purchase reduced fare products um, if they have, um, are receiving unemployment benefits or food assistance benefits in addition to um, also uh, doing job training. Next slide. So our property tax formula initiative has been, um, we kicked that off last fall with Scott Racker and the Robert D and Billy Ray Center. Um, Scott facilitated a um, course of four workshops for the commission. Um, last winter and early spring um, and um, really focused on trying to develop principles for the initiative um, as well as looking at formula options. And so want to um, just provide, a, provide an update on that. And so DART's um, budget currently is $36.9 million, just shy of $37 million. Of our revenues, 62.7% um, come from local property tax or our levy um, through local, local property taxes. And then an additional 21.3 comes from fares and contracts or revenue that DART generates on its own. And for most tr transit systems across the country, 20% um, is the mark that, um, or the industry average is 20% for revenues that you um, are able to generate on your own from fares and contracts. So we are, we are on par with other transit systems. 
And then the rest of our revenue does come from federal and state dollars along with a few other miscellaneous revenue sources. From an expense standpoint, um, the bulk of our expenses are putting vehicles at, in service out on the road every day. And so as you would expect, having a high number of operators and mechanics, the, our number one expense is salaries, wages, and fringes, along with services, fuel and lubricants, and equipment repair parts, or making sure the vehicles are in good, good working order. Next slide. Here is a, a run through of what the, um, different property tax levy rates are for DART with each one of our member communities. They range from 54 cents per thousand in unincorporated Polk County to 95 cents per thousand in Windsor Heights. And Johnston is currently at 66 cents per thousand. Next slide. Um, so the goals of the initiative were really to ensure that um, we're maintaining the regional intent of DART, that DART's member can communities can continue to find value in maintaining their membership and that we're able, um, that there's flexibility in the formula such that DART is able to meet the future needs of the community. Next slide. And so the commission also established operating values as we work through the process. Um, and the two that I wanna highlight is that as they work through the formula that um, in trying to find consensus, they recognize that the end solution will not likely be a perfect solution for everyone, that there was gonna have to be compromise as we work through the process. And that success is coming to agreement on a formula that aligns the costs and benefits to member communities and factors in the importance of regionality and how people travel. Next slide. And so there were seven principles that were established um, for the formula. And the first being that it has long-term viability. Second, that there's predictability. Third, transparency. Fourth, that there's a regional mindset to the formula. Fifth, that there's um, equity built in. Um, the sixth is ensuring that there's a base level of support. And seventh is that we were thinking creatively about the development of the formula. Next slide. And so there were a variety of formula options that were examined, um, and there were several variations based on each one of these. Um, the first was uh, establishing a flat rate so that every community paid the same property tax levy rate across the, the community. Um, the second is that uh, there would be a base buy-in of support or a base, base contract amount, and then um, there would be an increment for the level of service each community receives. The third is that the levy rate would be established based on population. The fourth was that the levy rate would be um, established based on service tiers. And then the one that most closely aligned and best reflected the principles that the commission established was the last one. And that is that it handled, um, a, provided an allocation to the city of Des Moines based on the shared benefit of service. And then all of the other member communities, would, the levy rate would be established based on population and service tiers. Next slide. And so here's a, a graphical description of, of the formula. You'll see that um, at the top, there's a, is what is needed for DART um, from, from property taxes. So our fiscal year 2021, 20, uh, we're currently collecting 22.46 million from the property tax levy. And then it allocates 49.2% of that um, 22 million to the city of Des Moines. And that 49.2 represents the shared benefit um, to other communities from the service that exists in Des Moines. Nearly all of the service runs through the city of Des Moines. And so, but because of its extension out to other member communities, there is a benefit um, to some of the cost that is incurred in the city of Des Moines to those other communities. And so we, we calculated that at 49.2%. So the remaining 50.8% of what's needed from the property tax levy would be allocated to each member community, 50% based on population and 50% based on the, the level of service that each community receives. And so we've created four different tiers of service. 
Um, the first being an extensive seven day a week service, which the city of West Des Moines falls into. The second um, tier would be a limited seven day a week service, which Altoona and Windsor Heights fall into. The third is primarily five day a week express service, um, which Johnston fits into along with Ankeny, Clive and Urbandale. And then the last tier is having a limited trips, paratransit or mobility on demand. And the communities that fall into that are Bondurant, Grimes, Pleasant Hill and Polk County. Next slide. So this is a shows um, kind of the, based on the current formula, which is the gray bar, the percent of dollars um, collected through the property tax levy that come from each member community. And so you'll see that Johnston currently pays 4.4% of that total amount collected from the property tax levy. With the new formula, it would go to 2.8%. Um, you'll see also that there is a significant increase for the city of Des Moines, going from 35.3% to 49.2%. And then also West Des Moines sees um, a bit of an increase going from 19.5% to 21.6%. Next slide. And so just to recap how the formula is applied is that we uh, annually through our budget process will determine the total amount that DART needs from property taxes. We'll allocate that dollar amount to Des Moines based on that 49.2% and then determine the dollar amount for other communities based on the remaining 50.8%. And then that's allocated 50% based on population and 50% based on the service tier that that community falls in. We still are constrained um, with our property tax levy, um, constrained with a 95 cent cap. And so any member community that needed to levy above that 95 cents to meet their commitment to DART um, would need to buy it down or, or find alternate funds to, to meet that commitment. Um, we also, um, we talked to the city of Des Moines extensively as the commission worked to develop this formula, recognizing the impact that, that they were gonna see as a result of the change in the formula. And so they did request that the new formula phase in over eight years rather than five years. And that they also, um, I think there was, it was apparent through the process, um, the city of Des Moines definitely um, felt it the most, but I think there's recognition by the rest of the DART Commission that property taxes and some of the constraints it provides may not be the best long-term fu funding mechanism for DART as we look to the long-term. And so the request of the city of Des Moines was really to start to focus all of DART's legislative energy as we think about the upcoming legislative session and future legislative sessions on finding another funding source to either replace the property tax levy or supplement it and provide some additional funding diversification for DART so it's not totally reliant on property taxes. The city of Des Moines recognized that the formula that the commission's come up with is, is incredibly fair um, and wanted to be able to move that forward. Um, and so um, recognizing that it's probably gonna take multiple legislative sessions to work through some of the, the funding issues that they're willing to buy down that property tax levy for the first three years as we work to um, address the legislative needs. And so here's a, what um, it looks like to phase the formula in over eight years. Um, so it would be a kind of a hybrid formula till we get to 100% um, in 2029 um, with uh, using kind of the, the current formula or allocation to each community and then um, a increment every year um, would be based on the new formula. Next slide. And then lastly, this shows um, kind of the, what happens to um, each community's levy rates under um, this blended phase in of the formulas. So currently uh, Johnston is at 66 cents per thousand. The white bars show um, what, if we were to continue on with the current formula, what the levy rate would, and would likely um, would be estimated at. The purple bars show what the, um, the blended phase in and kind of the ultimate levy rate under the new formula for each community. So 
Again, Johnson's currently at 66 cents per thousand. Um, under the new formula in the eight year period, it would then go um, below 40 cents per thousand. And again, valuations factor into this significantly. So if there's any increases or decreases in valuation, it would impact that, that rate on an annual basis. So we are, um, uh, so the commission has, has done its due diligence around the formula. Um, we're in the process of um, formalizing documentation and doing member community outreach. Um, hope to have that wrapped up by early January. Um, we have not to date heard any concerns around the new formula. So at this juncture, we're planning to recommend approval of the new formula at the, to the commission at their February meeting. Should they approve it, then the new formula would go into effect um, in that kind of um, uh, in, in conjunction, uh, ah, sorry, got tongue tied. The new formula would go into effect or we would um, do that in the development of our FY22 budget, which would be certified in March. Um, any questions on the formula before I provide a brief update on the operations and maintenance facility. All right, here. I don't hear any, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, so just uh, lastly, wanna give you a brief update on our operations and maintenance facility. This is a discussion that the commission has been having over the last um, 18 months or so. Our existing facility is located at 1100 Dartway, which is off of uh, behind the BP station off of Southwest 9th and um, south of MLK there, just south of downtown. Um, the facility is um, well over 40 years and past its useful life. It's also, we're located in the floodplain. Um, the facility was completely underwater in 1993 we took on a lot of water in 2008, but we are regularly under, um, our tunnel system underneath the building is regularly um, uh, filled with water whenever there's a water event. And you'll see in the, the pictures to the left, um, that are, is our tunnels underneath the building um, and all of our mechanical systems um, run through that tunnel system. Um, that is way the, the building was designed and, and built. And so given the amount of um, the age of the mechanical systems, as well as the fact that they have been under, submerged underwater multiple times, we need to replace all of those, those systems here in the upcoming years. The facility, um, as we think about the storage barn and, and other components of the facility, it's really um, undersized for the, the current day bus. Um, we have over, over 100 garage doors um, at our existing facility. And um, currently our electric buses would not fit through our storage, our main storage barn. So um, they're both just a little bit too tall and a little bit too wide. And so as we think about the buses of the future, probably not getting smaller from a height and width standpoint, we are gonna to need to reconstruct that facility in order to, to put, um, put buses in it. Next slide. So the commission has been considering over the last um, year or so, whether it's most prudent to um, continue to invest in our existing facility or consider building a new facility. The Federal Transit Administration um, has uh, told us that they are not interested in continuing to invest in our existing facility um, with uh, discretionary grant dollars. Um, and to put their money where their mouth is, um, they have granted DART over $17 million towards um, a new facility should the commission decide to move forward with it um, with the possibility of additional grant funding. And so the commission is continuing to decide discuss whether to move forward with design and think about the new facility or continuing to invest in the existing facility. And just wanted to apprise you of those conversations since they will be continuing in earnest after the first of the year. Next slide. So as we think about what's next for DART, you know, we are really working to ensure that we are providing the most efficient and effective service possible to our member communities and in wanting to be as responsive 
responsive as possible to our communities. And so we're continuing to find ways to leverage technology and find efficiencies in our service, exploring sustainable funding options, as well as evaluating both our community and rider needs, um, and as well as examining new mobility options so that we can serve a region that's expected to grow to a million people and do it in the best way possible. So with that, I'll take any questions and just appreciate your time and attention so we can provide a DART update tonight. Does the council have any questions for Elizabeth? Elizabeth, I'm not hearing any. Uh, I want to thank you and, and uh, Russ for joining us this evening. You've covered a lot of uh, material in a very short period of time. I'm certain that as the uh, council and staff think about uh, the information that you shared tonight, they will likely have some questions and I would just suggest that they can either, you know, uh, get those to me and I can probably respond to many of them, but if not, uh, you know, I can uh, always forward them to you or they could probably contact you directly. Is that yep. correct, Elizabeth? Whatever works best. Yeah, Elizabeth does a really nice job of responding to uh, emails. So I would encourage you to um, reach out to her if you have any questions as well. Before I let you go, I just wanna let the uh, council and staff know that uh, Elizabeth, you, um, you do an outstanding job in leading the uh, DART organization. Um, you know, you run a very lean, efficient operation. We've, you know, you've, you've taken it through some, some very difficult times, particularly with COVID over the last several months, but uh, you always come out on top. So um, thank you for your leadership. And uh, I want to just give a shout out to Russ as well, out to Russ as well. He has been the chair now of, of DART for less than a year and has just done an amazing job uh, in that role. He works very hard at it, and uh, he has uh, really been a good uh, team member, <clears throat> team team member, and support for Elizabeth as well as uh, uh, you know hurting all of us cats, uh, the uh, mayors and the and the council members from the various communities that that meet uh, at the Dart uh, Commission meetings and make sure that uh, Dart continues to go in the right direction. So kudos to both of you. Thanks again for joining this, joining us this evening and, and uh, keep up the good work. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate thank you, it. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you for your nice comments, Mayor. Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I think the next, I've lost my agenda again. My iPad keeps going to sleep on me, but I think next on the agenda is Bravo. And I saw some uh, chat box communication going back and forth between Sally and Cindy. So um, Sally, are you with us this evening? I am, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad we got the presentation squared away and I'm going to take just a few minutes of your time to give sort of a state of the arts update uh, about what's happening in Greater Des Moines. So thank you all um, for the opportunity to present and certainly want to appreciate Scott Soroka, who represents the city of Johnston on the Bravo board. We appreciate his perspective and, and leadership and are hopeful about what 2021 is going to bring. So just as a quick reminder, before we get into some of the details about where our community stands, a reminder about Bravo's purpose. You know, certainly we were formed to serve as a centralized grant funder for arts, culture, and heritage, but our vision is really much broader. We believe strongly that arts, culture, and heritage are tied to every single regional priority that we are working together to tackle. And so we are working to balance our focus on funding, but also leadership beyond grant making to ensure that we're maximizing our impact on things that are critical. Next slide, thanks. We think this is particularly important. Certainly the grant making is critical, but it's really important um, to look at it holistically because arts, culture, and heritage are a critical part of our region success. Uh, you may or may not be aware that in our last cycle, Bravo supported more than 70 nonprofit organizations through our grant programs. 
And these organizations are truly essential to the region's well being, not just from a quality of life perspective, but also from an economic impact standpoint. The numbers that you're seeing here are a little bit dated at this point, um, but uh, based on the data that we have, we know that these arts and culture organizations are driving more than $185 million in annual economic impact, employing more than 5,000 people and generating a significant amount in government revenue. For perspective, the year this data um, was collected, the revenue generated by these organizations was 16.8 million. The public revenue in, in these organizations was about three and a half million. So the return on investment is significant. And I'm sorry to say that the impact of COVID-19 has, uh, has been serious on these organizations. Next slide. Um, it certainly isn't a competition that anyone would want to win, but um, there was no sector hit harder in the first three months of the pandemic than the leisure and hospitality industry, which includes arts and cultural venues and experiences. Monumental drops in employment, uh, and unfortunately, those also tie to revenue losses. Next slide. Uh, the financial impact to Iowa's, only Iowa's arts and culture organization, these are statewide numbers, was 38.7 million. That number's probably been uh, increased um, over the last few weeks. 97% um, of the organizations reported that they had had to cancel events. 63% reported that they had modified operating status and more than 3.4 million people in lost attendance. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was how severe you expect the overall financial impact to be, and 57% responded extremely severe. A statistic you're not seeing on this slide, but we take very seriously, is that 8% of organizations also responded that they were not confident they were going to survive the pandemic. If you think back to that 70 organization number that I gave you, that's five to seven organizations that do not believe they're going to make it through this pandemic. And I'll tell you, I don't know which ones we can afford to lose. It's a pretty, um, it's a pretty dire situation. Now, um, I do have to say that there are, um, despite the major challenges, our arts and culture organizations have stepped up in incredible ways. And it's important that we celebrate as well as recognize the challenges. Uh, the, the Playhouse, the Des Moines Community Playhouse created drive-in theater so that people could still enjoy live theater. Art Force Iowa is an organization that serves some of our most vulnerable um, young people. They actually realized that very few of their, their participants had internet, reliable internet. So they actually created DVDs of their art programs and took DVD players and DVDs out so that those young people could still engage with art and their community. The Botanic Garden shifted their plant sale. They usually have an in-person plant sale in the spring. They shifted it to an online plant sale and said they made more money than they've ever made. They may never go back to an in-person plant sale. The Des Moines Metro Opera so creatively took um, last year's season and their long-standing relationship with Iowa PBS and were able to broadcast an entire season of operas all across the state and nationwide. Um, you may have seen that before her death, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was corresponding regularly with the Des Moines Metro Opera and was eagerly awaiting the presentation of Billy Budd. The Blank Park Zoo Science Center and Living History Farms were the first organizations to reopen to in-person experiences and operate summer camps. They had zero outbreaks in their summer camp programs thanks to the care and concern they placed on safety. So there is a lot to be concerned about for the future, but there's also a great deal to celebrate as we look forward. Um, Bravo also had to respond in this situation and had less than ideal circumstances. As you may um, see from this presentation, we were budgeted at um, a little bit under $5 million in hotel motel tax revenue. Um, we actually ended up netting about 4 million. So that was 20% less than we had anticipated. Despite that million dollar shortfall, we still paid 100% of our GC20 grant commitments. And we actually advanced our quarterly payments. Any organization that wanted a payment sooner was able to get that. We were able to do that in both of our second half payments. Um, and we know that that made a critical difference for a number of the organizations we support. We were also able to invest in capital campaign and project grants and our public art grants, two programs that we weren't sure we were gonna be able to do. 
Um, so that's the good news. The, the less good news, the little bit of a challenging news is that we're currently budgeted at two and a half million dollars for 2021, uh, which is about half of obviously what we had budgeted for FY20. So the year is gonna look a little bit different. Next slide. So again, um, covering that FY20 hotel motel tax revenue, um, we were able to secure a PPP loan knowing that we were gonna have a shortfall. Uh, that loan has now been fully forgiven, I'm pleased to say. We also had partial furloughs for 100% of our staff. Just for the record, that was only three people, but we did implement partial furloughs for 100% of our staff over the summer. And unfortunately, we did have to execute a reduction in force. So Bravo is now a staff of just two. Um, the idea being we wanna maximize the funds we're able to invest in the organizations we support. We were, um, in addition, our response includes, we're updating our community investment programs. The biggest implication for your community is that we are um, not going to be able to make payments until April. And that's gonna, that's gonna affect some of the organizations we support. Another thing that may have impact for the city of Johnston is that we will not be running our public art grant program for Grant Cycle 21. We are focusing instead on the operating grants for the arts organizations that we support. Next slide. Um, another way that we've responded though is we've developed this campaign, the Let's Hear It for the Arts campaign. The idea is to create a rallying cry that everyone can get behind to make sure that arts and culture are included in every single recovery measure and every single conversation about how our community is going to reemerge. The next slide shows some of the consistent messages we're hoping that people will use. Uh, we will absolutely, this is on our website and we will make sure that you get a copy of this, but these are standard language and calls to action, if you will, that we hope everyone can get behind and use. Um, our cultural organizations can also share that so that we're speaking with one voice to make sure that arts and culture are lifted up and included as we move forward. I'm happy to take any questions. That is a year's worth of work in 11 slides, but I'm happy to take any questions about how Bravo responded or what 2021 looks like. And simply just wanna say again, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight and for your continued support. It is so critical. And now more than ever, we're so grateful for the dedicated revenue stream and your investment. Council, have any questions for Sally? No question. Um, just wanted to throw in a quick comment as um, I've had a chance to work with Sally a bit over the past year. And um, one, I think she's just been doing a phenomenal job in the entire Bravo Arts Board um, in managing a crazy year. And I know she touched on it in the presentation, but um, I think it just goes to show how, you know, fiscally responsible the board's been and Sally's been with um, Bravo's budget in that you know, not only were they able to maintain all payments that were already promised to organizations that were planning on those funds for the budget, um, the fact that they're actually able to advance quarterly payments, I think, um, as Sally mentioned, is huge. Um, also just wanted to note, um, Sally and the exec board of Bravo have been doing really great work on kicking off um, and continuing efforts relating to diversity and inclusion, both among the makeup of the Bravo board itself, but also in our grant making, which is really exciting to see. Um, and then also, I know Sally mentioned too, but <laughs> I think is worth reiterating, you know, at the beginning of the year, the board was talking about um, actually hiring another person for Bravo. And, you know, we actually ended up having to lay someone off because of the pandemic. And so all of the work, um, which is way more than two people can do is following, following on the work of two people, um, Sally and Amy. So um, just major thanks to everything they do, um, leading a challenging year and what will for sure be another challenging year at least uh, as the recovery turns around. So just wanna share my thanks for their work. Mayor, so, this is Jim, Jim Sanders. Let me just make a quick comment. I just want to remind the council and, and uh, express appreciation for Sally and an organization. It, just a year ago that we um, dedicated the Tree of Life in Terra Park, and uh, Bravo was a major contributor to the piece of art that we were able to acquire and put up, and we know how iconic that's been for not only our citizens today, but for many years to come. And, and uh, all that was due to the efforts of Bravo and we're 
I feel very fortunate having that organization available and, and giving us the funding we needed to, to put in a, a pretty important art piece within our community. And Sally, before you slip away, I just want to say it's been kind of fun over the last several months to watch how creative the arts and culture community have become in making sure that uh, we continue to enjoy what they have to offer. Uh, in fact, last week, I, I over the weekend, I uh, uh, watched the symphony do their Winterland performance, which was in, in, in the comfort of my own home <laughs> on my big TV screen. Um, who would have ever guessed? And I, you know, I think it really is going to change the way we um, participate in some of those uh, events and activities in the future. And I think, you know, for the good. So that, you know, to the extent that people can enjoy that from their homes, um, you know, more and more people will have the opportunity to participate. So it's uh, it's been fun, and and I uh, look forward to what uh, they they. Uh, what new ideas they have for the future for us. So thanks again, uh, Sally, for all of your hard work and everything you do, do to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, our quality of life here in the uh, Des Moines metro area um, is, is the, you know, of the highest quality it, it absolutely can be. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thanks again, everybody. Happy holidays. You too. Thank you. With that, let's move on to the next agenda item, which is, oh, before we move on, uh, Cindy, can you tell if there's anyone else that is with us this evening that would like to make a comment under public communications on an item that is not on the agenda? I do not see anyone indicating such. Okay, we will move then on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Oh, oh, we have a public hearing still. We have someone that would like to speak? No, we have a public hearing. Oh, I jumped over it. Here we go. We do have a public hearing. Uh, and to consider approval of the first reading of ordinance number 1046, an official zoning map amendment for approximately 8.93 acres from AR to R1100 with an over, with with a overlay. The subject property is located at 11087 Northwest Towner Drive, PZ Case 20-23. And we'll open this public hearing at eight o'clock. Clayton Ender here this evening. And Cindy, if you wanna maybe open up the uh, draft preliminary plat, um, that'd be a good one to talk off of. Uh, what we have tonight is a request to rezone approximately 8.93 acres from AR Agricultural Reserve to R1100 single family residential with the animal keeping overlay zoning district. Um, if we can go to that second page, Cindy. Uh, staff is working with the, the applicants on a, a preliminary plat for the subdivision of this property. Um, that remains under staff review. So this is not the action item tonight, but I'm gonna use this as a discussion tool. Um, generally what's being proposed to be rezoned would be what's shown as lots one, two, three, and four, and the adjoining out lot to the west, to the top of lot four there. Um, the remaining areas on the north would remain zoned ag reserve um, to be split into two 10 acre parcels. Um, the intention here is to subdivide the property for construction of several single family homes. This property is included in the Thrive 2040 comprehensive plan. It's identified with a medium density residential uh, category and parks and open space category. The medium density residential is intended to accommodate a mix of uses, generally six to 10 units an acre, um, which may include single family detached residential. Um, the parks and open space uh, is intended to reflect areas that would either be accommodated into public parkland or areas of natural resources such as floodplain or wooded areas that deserve special attention during the development process. Um, on this particular property, there'd be no public parkland. We're really looking at the parks and open space component as uh, the floodplain and the wooded areas along Beaver Creek there. Um, the area um, that is generally outside the floodplain 
Um, the intention on this particular property was to try and concentrate housing to preserve those natural resources. And that's why you see the medium density designation. The R1100 district, uh, the max density doesn't quite get up there to the six to 10 units an acre. Um, but we did seem to accommodate um, for single family uses in the medium density residential. And the goal of this development is to preserve those uh, natural resources uh, down there with the trees and the floodplain. So staff is uh, confident that this is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, and it does leave opportunity for future development of areas of the property at higher densities if desired by the applicant and thus approved by the council. Um, the area- hey, Adam, or I mean, Clayton, can I interrupt you just for a second? Yes. So can you just, since you've got this map up here, I'm trying to figure out which lots are part of this rezoning. Cause when I, when I looked at the materials before the meeting, this looks just a little bit bigger. So can you walk me through the various lots that are being created? Yes. Um, I realize this is a rezoning and not a site plan, but I'm, but it, but, but I'm, 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 I'm struggling in figuring out what is the scope of the, all the land that's being rezoned. So that's really what I'm trying to figure out, so. Yes, yeah, so I, I included this as a, for discussion purposes, but what you're looking at, lot one, lot two, lot three, four, and out lot, is that Z just to the north there, Cindy? Yeah, out lot Z, that is the area to be rezoned. Lots five and six, out lot Y and out lot X would remain zoned ag reserve as currently zoned today. So five and six and Y and, and the other out are not covered by the rezoning. That's it's right. Just, here, yeah, Cindy here just pulled up the uh, rezoning district boundaries on that other attachment. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank thank you. Yeah, but that the preliminary plot certainly helped to give uh, yep yep more of a comprehensive view of what what's proposed to happen out here on this property. Um, the primary purpose for the rezoning is. Um, they aren't able to get the number of homes on the property that they desire under the Ag Reserve District. Um, so thus they would need the rezoning to the R1100 to support the additional homes. Um, and when, when I'm done with my comments, I'll let the applicants or the representative maybe go into some detail on what their intentions are on, on constructing out here on this property. Uh, Clayton, while, you're, while you just said uh, the rezoning, can you tell me how many homes per acre will be allowed with the new rezoning? Yes, so the within the area to be zoned R1100, uh, the maximum density is 1.94 units an acre. In the area that would remain ag reserve, it'd be um, one home per 10 acres. So that lot one, which is 2.57, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. But basically, lot one basically stays the same as one, one home. I mean, you're saying that it's one home per one point, what did you say, nine acres? Uh, 1.94 units per acre or one home per lot. So, okay, this, so two, here okay. they'd be showing it that there'd be. So there'd be two homes there. One lot one would have one home, lot two would have one home. Now it could be further subdivided in the future or rezoned in the future to a higher density, but what they're showing is one home per lot. So they're showing six homes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this uh, uh, proposal does include the uh, um, animal keeping overlay zoning district in those areas R1100. Um, the intention there is for personal animal keeping, not commercial animal keeping, um, generally consistent with hobby farm type uses. Animal keeping is also allowed in the Ag Reserve Zoning District, so the entire area would be eligible for animal keeping. Um, adjacent land uses to the north uh, opposite Beaver Creek, that those properties remain in unincorporated Polk County and they're used for single family residential uses. To the east, which is the bottom of the screen there, uh, that is 
uh, owned by the United States of America, used by Camp Dodge. It is important to note that the properties could experience noise, dust, uh, other disturbances just, uh, created by um, active military training activities. So uh, it's a buyer beware situation. They are there first. Uh, to the south, you got um, some single family homes along the south side of Northwest Towner Drive, as well as Beaver Creek Golf Course. Uh, it is, Beaver Creek Golf Course is in, in the city of Johnston, um, and it's intended to be uh, redeveloped at some point in the future as an employment base for the community. Uh, no active development proposals are submitted or known at this time there, but uh, we will likely be seeing that redevelop at some point. And then finally, on the north side of Towner Drive, there's also some single family homes which are shown for medium density residential redevelopment in the comprehensive plan. Um, backing up to the comprehensive plan, we do also show a um, north south roadway from Northwest Towner Drive uh, through this property um, across Beaver Creek, connecting up to the intersection of 110th Court and Northwest Road Drive. Um, which is just off the page here on the right hand side. Uh, while the exact need for this road is probably not uh, necessary at this time, when it comes time to the preliminary platting, um, we do want to make sure we're taking that into consideration. The zoning change itself would not um, prohibit the ability of that in the future. Um, so staff is working with the, the applicants there to make sure we're reserving enough um, ability should, should that road be needed in the future. Um, regarding utilities to service the property, uh, there's currently no sanitary sewer available, so homes would have to be on septic system. Um, this is in the, an area that would be um, able to be served by the future uh, City of Johnston sewer, which is under design but not yet constructed. Um, it is within the area of the Xenia Rural Water District litigation um, with time frame unknown on resolution there. So water service um, uh, remains a bit in the air until we get some resolution there. And then as for storm sewer, there's currently no storm sewer. So all that water would be addressed through overland flowage. Um, this item has gone to the Planning and Zoning Commission. They have recommended approval and notice has been provided pursuant to uh, Iowa code and no public comments have been received to date. I'd be happy to go into detail or answer any questions if you have them. And I do show the applicants, Adam and Ben and their representative, Eric Cannon um, on the call this evening, should they wish to add anything or if you have questions of them. With that, I'll finish up my comments. Council have questions for Clayton? or the applicants? This is a public hearing on this item. Is there anybody who is with us that would like to make uh, any comments? Cindy, are we Seeing anyone? I'm seeing, I'm seeing no one. Okay. Well, if there are no questions or comments, <clears throat> Council, we will close the public hearing then at 811. Is there a motion to approve first reading of ordinance number 1046? Move approval, Cope. Second, Martin. A motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yep. Roca? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the consent agenda. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to raise. Second, Scott. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Reddy? Yes. Roca? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. 
Moving on to the non-consent agenda, item 8A, consider third and final reading of ordinance number 1044, an ordinance amending the Johnson Revised Ordinance of 2007 by amending chapter 90 to modify operation of curb valve and hydrants and hydrants and to adopt and publish. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, there have been no public comments received today and no changes um, to the ordinance at this time. Okay. Council have any questions for Matt? Sorry. For Matt. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the third and final reading of ordinance number 1044 and to adopt and publish? I motion. Second, Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Soroka. Yes. Oh. Oh. Evans. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready. Yeah. Oh. Thomas, there he is. Oops, Tom, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, my bad. Motion passed. Moving on to item 8B, consider policy regarding City of Johnson debris management policy. Jim Sanderson, uh, this is the policy that we use when we, um, uh, to, to guide our management of storm debris. Um, with this year's three storms that we had to um, provide some level of service um, to, it seemed like a good time to go ahead and update the, the uh, policy. We have had several conversations with the uh, ad hoc uh, group to talk about uh, uh, some of the uh, items that are listed in the policy. I'm, I'm gonna focus on, there's really two parts to the policy. One part is the uh, vegetative debris policy, and, and that is actually more of a metro-wide policy. The, the part I want to focus on tonight is the Johnson debris management policy. And you can see by the red lines, there's a lot of changes with this. And really, it's, it's just more updating it uh, with what we're, what we're dealing with uh, today. Um, whether we implement this policy is really considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So when we have a storm event, uh, there's an assessment to see how much damage is across the community and uh, we will identify uh, the area that has received damage that would that would um, uh, cause us to to do some debris removal uh, in some cases it's the whole entire community the the three events we had this summer the first two events were a, a smaller area that were damaged significantly during the storm and then the third event was really more of a community-wide event so so we, we implement this policy as necessary uh, to help our citizens uh, uh, with uh, debris removal when we have significant storm events. Um, the, um, this policy also establishes guidelines as far as uh, who's responsible and, and primarily most often when we have storm events, the, the property owner is responsible for the collection and uh, 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 of the storm debris and, and making sure that it gets uh, dealt with. Uh, um, and in most cases, they use the Metro Waste Authority curb it program. Um, if, uh, if, if storm damage happens on city property, which includes street trees along the roadway, that's when the city will um, step in and, and clean that debris up. Or uh, when the debris falls across the street, we get that off the street and, and then follow through with uh, uh, whatever debris removal we need to have. Um, the other thing we tried to address with this is that we, with uh, uh, the Kerbit um, um, uh, program and the City of Johnston program, both for if we have a drop-off event or if we do a curbside, each of those um, different um, cleanups had different guidelines. And so what we've tried to do is clean that up with this policy as well and, and be more consistent. So. Uh, when we talk about the length of um, branches that can be picked up or taken to a drop-off site, we try to be much more consistent with this policy update. And, um, um, and then we also, one of the main issues that, that really came up during these events this year was um, 
currently or in the past, we've only provided service to single and two family homes. And with the, the events we had this year, it was questioned on uh, why the city doesn't uh, pick up condominium and townhomes. Uh, the, the thought or the, the um, concern was that they pay property taxes. Most of them are owner occupied and they should get the same benefit that uh, other um, residential property tax payers pay. And so we took a look at that. We talked about it several times with the ad hoc group and we decided to um, include um, townhomes and condominiums in this policy so that in future events, if we decide to do any type of a cleanup, those uh, um, uh, single family or, or multifamily uh, uh, properties would be included. And we, it, within this, we have guidelines that they would need to bring the, the debris out to a public street so that our um, staff can pick up the debris along the public street. So, so anyway, quite a few updates with this. Uh, I gave it to you in the red line form, plus I also did a, a clean one as well because uh, sometimes it's easier to read through um, the changes that are being proposed. But uh, with this, I would um, take any questions the council may have and would ask the council would consider approving the policy and that this will be our policy going forward when we um, have storm events in the future. Does anyone have any questions for Jim? I just, I guess, like to pipe in, I, I, uh, I think the change for the uh, uh, Townhome Association's uh, home uh, makes sense. I, you know, both Jim and I participated in a meeting with some citizens um, in, the, in uh, the original Green Meadows neighborhood who lived in a townhome association who, you know, I think it was after the Duratio event felt uh, that it was sort of a bizarre event where the city was picking up debris on one side of them and the other side, but not picking up their debris causing some sort of um, challenges for their neighborhood. So I think this change in policy is, is, a, is a good move and I, I would support it. Jim, um, I was involved in the discussions on the proposed changes. Um, I'm not seeing where we wrote in that um, the townhome associations would need to take it to a, um, uh, a, a street where the trucks can can drive by and pick it up. I'm not seeing. Um, I it's right there in the middle of the page where it says residents um, in, in black letter. Right. Required. So we'll be required to place the debris at the curb or with, within the public right away. So couldn't that be right out in front of our home? Most of the roads within town home and condominium complexes are private drives. And so the, the roads that typically go in and, and service their uh, a garages are typically private drives. So right. we're requesting that they take it to the public road which will be, you know, um, for example, we have quite a few associations along um, right. Greendale Road. So they need to bring the debris out to Greendale Road. All the roads that go off of Greendale are um, private drives. And I understand that's the intent. I'm not sure that statement is very clear in, in requiring that. Yes, Mayor, I think what we need to do is strike the ore. Um, so it would just place the tree debris at the curb within the public right of way. That would be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that, that's a good change. Any other questions or comments? If not, do we have a motion to approve the policy regarding the City of Johnson debris management? Policy? Move approval, Cope. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Roper. Motion passed. Sorry, just a quick question. That includes the mayor's suggestion, the change, right? Just I, I, we noted that. Okay, great. 
Yes, all good. Motion passed. Thank you, thank you, Councilman Soroka. Moving on to item 8D, consider the following items related to the proposed rezoning of approximately 4.49 acres in adjoining right of way. Mayor, it's, yes. 8C. Pardon? 8C is next. Oh, I'm sorry. Item 8C, consider resolution number 20-316, approving town center marketing plan and extending purchase and development deadlines. Uh, good evening, this is Dave I'm covering for Adam tonight. Um, as council is aware, um, we've got an existing development agreement with Hanson in place that dates back to October of uh, 2019. Uh, we did do an amendment to that in October of 2020 to um, extend some dates of sort of the first uh, phase um, property purchase and building completion dates <clears throat> and also requiring a, a need to submit a marketing plan uh, before the 1st of December. Um, that amendment allowed for a, a six month extension of those deadlines uh, by mutual agreement. And so what's uh, before you tonight is um, the marketing plan that was submitted by Hanson. Um, and I know Troy Hanson, I believe is on, can, can speak to that. And also the su um, suggestion with the resolution that we would extend those dates. Um, first phase property purchase to June 1, 2021 um, and completion. Um, by um, April 30th, 2022. So be happy to answer any questions on that. Um, obviously it's, both of these are related uh, to some of the market conditions as a result of, of COVID. And as I mentioned, uh, Troy is on as well and can answer specific questions related to the marketing plan that they have uh, put together for uh, marketing the town center. Does Collins have any questions for David or for Troy? Wow, David, we should have you present Adam's items all the time. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Mayor, well, yes. Mayor, I just have a quick question for uh, for Troy Hansen. Okay. So, uh, Troy, I'm reviewing your kind of the marketing document that's um, Johnson Town Center um, and kind of looking at um, – uh, the page is current prospect conversations updated. Uh, all of that looks looks good. Um, I mean, I, I know this is a challenging time. Uh, I guess the only question I would have or thought or suggestion would be, I noticed that you have a nail salon listed here. I, I am sort of in shock that we our community could still need another nail salon. Um, so, you know, just, just, say, just point that out for um, for whatever effect that has. But um, anyway, certainly very excited about some of the other uh, types of activities you've got going on here. I think clearly we're wanting to have the town center be, a, you know, draw some unique and new types of businesses that maybe aren't currently as prominent in our community. But I'm um, so excited about um, some of the other things you got going on there, but just, but maybe not quite as excited about the potential for another nail salon, but I know there is demand for those. So anyway, just wanted to pass that along. Understood. Other questions or comments? If not, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 20-316? Move approval, Cope. Second, Evan. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Freddie? Yes. Roca? Yes. Oh. Yes. Motion passed. Item 8D, consider the following items related to the proposed rezoning of approximately 4.49 acres and adjoining right of way at 5605 Northwest 100th Street. Second reading of ordinance number 1045 amending the amending the official amending the official zoning map, changing property zoned IC, Industrial Commerce Park, to M1 Light Industrial District. Waive third reading of ordinance number 1045 and adopt and publish the same per request of the applicant. Uh, Aaron Wolf, Community Development. 
Uh, this is the second reading and there's been no changes since the first. Um, again, this is for um, rezoning property in the West Park PUD from IC Industrial Commerce Park District to M1 Light Industrial District. Um, the applicant has requested the council consider waiving the third reading and to adopt and publish the ordinance. And while waiving a third reading on a rezoning is not typical practice, in this instance, it's not completely absurd uh, because the zoning change is, is limited to outdoor storage only and we've received no public comment. Um, I don't have access, I don't think, to the um, attendees tonight. I don't know who's attending this meeting. I'm hoping there's somebody representing the applicant if you, you should have questions for them. Um, otherwise, I'm able to answer any questions you might have for me about this rezoning. Aaron, a question I would have is, and not that I'm opposed to it, but um, is there some urgency around um, uh, the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of this and, and the reason why we're uh, being asked to wait the third reading? I asked the applicant to um, submit to me an email um, explaining the urgency and they did. And um, it, 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 I don't think there's a, a extreme urgency to, to waive the third reading, but I would defer to the applicant if they're with us tonight. Yeah, this is, guys, this is Marcus Pitts talking. I think the, um, you know, the urgency from a financial standpoint is we purchased this building beginning of the year, we got hit with COVID, we got hit with, uh, um, you know, a tenant that was now financially insolvent. Now we're trying to sell the building here to uh, American Fence and, you know, every, every day that uh, um, it, it's been a, um, it's been a roller coaster, but every, you know, every day that goes by, it just costs us more to sit on a vacant property. So, um, the sooner we can get this pushed through, if there's no other changes, um, um, you know, hopefully the better for everybody, the buyer, the seller, the city, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you do have a, you do have a buyer of this property. Correct. I'm the seller. So I, I, I'm right. the property owner, um, mayor, and then, uh, the buyer's American fence. Um, right. and that's the one that's presented the uh, site plan and, and the other uh, supporting documentation. And they're just waiting for this action to be taken so that. Correct. And then we can proceed to close. Okay. Okay. Does council have any other questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve second reading of ordinance number 1045? So moved, Cope. Second, Slash. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Letty? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. And do we have a motion to approve third reading of ordinance num number 1045 and to adopt and publish? So moved, Cope. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Letty? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? No. Motion passed. Moving on to item 8E, consider approval of claims in the amount of $1,697,374.68. Do we have a motion to approve? Move approval, Cope. Second, Evans. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Reddy? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to city administrator staff comments. We have one list. Yes. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> I have three things I just want to highlight real quick. Um, just some things that have happened within the last couple of weeks since our last council meeting. Uh, first of all, um, as you may recall, we, there was a lot of conversation prior to COVID in uh, discussing the regional water uh, with Des Moines Water Works and, and other, other communities that would be served by the regional water. And we had a series of meetings up to around February of 2020 and uh, when COVID hit, um, the meetings with these large, lar larger group, which included all the communities basically came to a, a standstill. But during the COVID um, 
since March of 2020, the, um, uh, the, the large, the main group of Des Moines Water Works, West Des Moines Water Works and Urbandale Water Works have continued to meet. They've had over a dozen meetings since March to talk about what a regional water system would look like and, and uh, some of the issues and, you know, that they need to address before we, um, uh, before a regional water system is, is um, uh, considered by the, by the other communities. And so what happened uh, last week, they provided an update to everybody, the larger group. Um, it appears they are making some progress in addressing each of the issues that they um, that they has become uh, has been identified throughout this process, and so I just want to let the council know that that um, this group has continued to meet in a in a larger or smaller scale, and they are ready to uh, eventually bring back a proposal. Um, they've got several additional meetings that are that are proposed for this spring, um, but um, uh, they do understand there's a sense of urgency around this issue, and and uh, so they want to continue. With their conversations and then they'll bring it back to the larger group uh, for uh, discussion and, and potential consideration from councils later on. So just want to let you know this this conversation is continuing and we'll hear more about it after the first of the year. The other item um, it relates to the Central Iowa water trails and there's been a group that has been meeting to discuss uh, the whole water trail initiative, which includes, uh, you know, as, as you're aware, we have two access points to Beaver Creek now. Altogether, there's about 81 access points that are being discussed to different water uh, tributaries from the Des Moines River and Raccoon River throughout the metro area. And so um, there's a group that's been meeting to talk about what the governance of that would look like in, in uh, addressing some of the issues uh, and making sure there's some consistency on how we manage our uh, assets going forward. Um, and so um, there's, a, uh, there, there's been a group, again, with a series of meetings. Uh, actually, Mayor Derenfeld uh, participated in the last meeting we had. Uh, after the first year, um, there will be a, a 28E agreement and some bylaws that are going to be proposed by the group in trying to organize a, a, the Iowa Central Iowa Water Trails organization, which will have a board of directors, which uh, we would participate in. And, and um, uh, but it, it will um, basically, uh, again, provide some consistency and some governance over this initiative for all the, the water trails that are being constructed around, or water trails and access points that are being constructed around the metro area. So again, more to come on that issue, but I just wanted to give you guys a, a heads up on that. And then just one final thing I had for this evening is I, I've received probably about 15 or 18 emails related to climate change, uh, the committee and, and uh, encouraging the community to do the emission study um, uh, related to the climate change. And so I haven't uh, shared those with the council yet. I didn't want to send 15 or 18 emails or forward them to you. So I'm going to uh, create one email that'll have all the, the um, uh, copies of all the emails that we received so far. And uh, because this conversation will continue when we have our um, second strategic planning meeting on January 5th. And so I want to make sure you all have the feedback we've gotten from citizens. And I will put that together and I get that to you. Hopefully, if not by um, the end of this week, by the first part of next week, so you'll have that information going into the conversation as we continue discussion about that um, at the January 5th um, strategic planning session. So that's all I have this evening. Okay. We do have a listed item, MetroNet update. Yes, this is Matt again. I just wanted to provide uh, everyone with an update on Metronet. They have submitted three permits um, here at Public Works. Uh, the first one is to construct one of their fiber backbones, which runs on 86 to 70th and then on 100th Street. Um, they plan on beginning promptly after the first of the year to start construction or, or boring conduit for that fiber backbone. Uh, the second permit moves into the um, what you see here on the screen was the uh, Newport Point Vista and Ashton Point neighborhood. And then the third permit is for Green Meadows North and the Augustine neighborhood. Uh, Metronet's indicated that they'd like to start work 
um, second or third week of February um, in those areas. With that, MetroNet has um, began to send out letters and postcards to our residents and start their communications on their projects. And I believe they've even deployed some of the, the yard darts. Um, Janet has been working with MetroNet and has posted information on how residents can contact MetroNet uh, if they have any questions about the construction process. Um, and that is on the city's website. So what you're looking at here is, is the fiber plan right in the middle is 86th Street. And then you've got Green Meadows North there off to the, to the right of the screen and Augustine to the left. So I just wanted to, wanted to provide a brief update on, on MetroNet and where they're at in their process. Thank you, Matt. And Jim, related to that, we do have a public meeting coming up to discuss broadband. Yes, um, the, the work that w Howard R. Green has been work doing on our behalf related to the broadband study, they are gonna have their first public meeting on January 13th. And um, we'll make sure the council all is, is aware of that, but that, that is um, what the plan is. We did have a last week, we did have an update on where they've, what they've accomplished so far and, and what is planning to be discussed at the um, at December, or excuse me, the January 13th meeting. We did send a recording of that meeting out to all the council members. I hope you had an opportunity if you, if, uh, uh, to, to listen to the recording and get the update on where we are with the uh, broadband study. That was um, a good conversation and, and there's been a lot of progress and, and a lot more progress that'll happen in the, in the next several weeks. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Anything else under city administrator staff comments, Jim? I don't have anything. I don't know if anybody else has anything they would like to talk about this evening. Sounds like that might be it. Okay, well, let's move to city council comments then. Council, uh, Councilwoman Martin. Uh, I will just put out there, thank you very much to um, Public Works on the great snow removal for that kind of surprise big snow we had. Um, I, I wasn't out and about after it, but uh, I heard no complaints and hearing nothing usually means people are happy. So thank you very much. Yeah. Councilman Cole. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Matt Greiner for taking some time Friday to meet with a constituent to talk about some of uh, the work on uh, 54th and 93rd. Uh, also just wanted to, um, uh, uh, John Schmitz on Parks and Rec, uh, on the earlier item about, um, uh, oh, the uh, plantings along the trails. I think that's a great concept. I've, I've had a couple of, of, of folks contact me, with me about um, seeing whether um, that those types of plantings might be able to be done along the trail system in Cross Haven as well. So just wanted to pass that along as that's an, there's some interest in um, that type of thing in, in that part of the community as well. Um, so that's it. Councilman uh, Soroka. I have uh, one comment of thanks for uh, Matt Greiner and Public Works um, for responding to a constituent concern about um, dark roads basically um, along Northwest 70th as you kind of pull out of the library um, and his team worked on uh, getting some reflectors installed to which they were much appreciative for. And then uh, final comment is just thanks to uh, Dave Wolwarding for um, giving me a tour of the Ridgecrest stormwater project. Um, I mean, it obviously is, you know, a neat project seeing the diagrams and everything come up um, before us, but I <laughs> did not realize just how large uh, of an undertaking it was before getting there in person and seeing all the really great work um, that's been done there. So thanks, um, Dave. Councilman Evans. I just wanted to comment on the very very nice and smooth transition on Merle Hay uh, to get that open. And I know everybody around here really appreciates it. Thank you. And one item just to add to that, we will be opening 62nd to the east of Merle Hay. Um, could be as early as the end of day tomorrow, but more likely to be on Wednesday. 
Awesome. Councilman Reddy. Yeah, um, just wanted to say thank you for all, all the staff and city council and everybody for making this a great year. This has been a year of a unique year, to say the least. It's been terrible in all terms of we had pandemic, we had several uh, incidents with Jericho, straight line lanes. Uh, this has been a unique year in every sense. So I just want to like thank everybody in spite of all this, you did a good job to keep the city running efficient. And thank you again. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, Councilman Reddy, it has been a challenging year, but uh, you know we've got we've got a good team that surrounds us. They do an amazing job, and you know we we pressed through it. So uh, thanks to everybody for all of your good efforts this year. And uh, with that, I just want to wish you all. Uh, great holidays coming up. Um, we've got uh, a couple of weeks to just uh, enjoy uh, our families and our friends, and and uh, you know make the uh, best of uh, of the time that we can spend together. So, best wishes and stay safe, and we'll see you next year. Thank Happy you very holidays, much, guys, everyone. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye. Good night.